from CUBE headquarters in Palo Alto, California. It's the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Hey, welcome to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. That's me, I have Jeff Frick co-guesting with me today, talking about a lot of great stuff, what's going on in Silicon Valley. We've been on the road uh, with theCUBE, but a lot of stuff happening in Silicon Valley, a lot of stuff happening around the world. Right. Obviously Trump continues to be the, um, some now call him the fake president, the riff on fake news, but uh, London's been a London a terrorist attack. Uh, people are dead, a lot of injured. Obamacare, potentially being repealed, we're going to talk about that. The wiretapping, we're going to talk about the Trump wiretapping revelations, but what it means from a tech perspective. We don't want to get the whole politics thing, but there is tech angles. I have an opinion on that. Jeff does too. We want to weigh in on that. A lot of, a lot of uh, big time news. We just came back from IBM um, Interconnect, their cloud show. Um, we had South by Southwest before that. Just a lot of good stuff. And of course, we had Don Tapscott on um, just two days ago. He's the new uh, author of the book, Blockchain Revolution. And then we're going to have Mark's sister of Venture Capital Upfront Ventures come on. Uh, he's going to call in. He's at limited partner meetings in San Francisco. Couldn't make it down to Palo Alto. We're going to talk about his new snap storms, his short little video clips that he's doing, which I love. I think they're game changing. He's a great guy, prolific, very transparent venture capitalist. We're going to talk to him. He's going to call in. Great lineup, Jeff. Um, big news going on. A lot of stuff happening. And you've just been a road warrior, John, so welcome back to Palo Alto. Well, you haven't, I'm getting ready for, you the, haven't been I'm here getting for, for the next show, DockerCon, <laughs> uh, one of our shows It's coming all about up. containers. The container madness, the whole world's changing. We're going to have a segment um, later with Don Tapscott talking about blockchain, and I think, you know, I'm wearing the container shirt, but there's a revolution happening in tech, and it's called blockchain. And this is now hitting a stride where it's going to start to see massive acceleration, in my opinion. And this has nothing to do with Bitcoin. It's everything to do with a technology shift that could potentially change how businesses are organized, run, and how they do business. So blockchain is potentially one of those, you know, once in a century, once in a lifetime, like situations where the world could literally change and accelerate a whole other dimension. So we're going to go deep into that. Um, but the news out there today is pretty bad. The London attack, that was uh, was pretty bad. You have Obamacare potentially being repealed uh, by a really fast and loose vote that's going down. And then of course you have the wiretapping accusation that Trump made up to Obama. A representative from California came out yesterday and said actually he's confirmed that, that actually there was some, some surveillance and some unmasking of Trump post-election with his team. Pretty serious revelations. Well, and what, a couple weeks ago, they said the CIA basically has a back door to everything. Uh, your phone, your television, microwave. everything else, your microwave oven. So, you know, all the things that we read about, I guess Big Brother, you can't even buy it anymore. It's sold out, they're going back to back to the presses. But, you know, all these things are, are real and they're here. And, and I don't know, I don't know if I'm more surprised than when we hear the revelations or if people are surprised that it's actually happening. I mean, we were just talking this morning, we had a, um, a CIO come into our office. We were talking about the cloud. Peter Burris was, was talking about some of the research he's doing, but the, all these attacks, the London situation, the Obamacare, the wiretapping, kind of points to the fact that we are so living in the old stone age of government. Why can't we use the data properly? For instance, the guy who was uh, mowed down, the people on the bridge and then got and killed, they had him on a watch list. He was a known ISIS terrorist. Right, right. Peripheral, as they say, but, and they lost track of him. How does that happen? Um, the wiretapping thing, how does that happen? Right, but it's security yeah. versus privacy, right? And this is where these things really come to a head. And at what point do you trade sec uh, privacy for security? And in fact, a lot of the privacy advocates will say that's really Big Brother's best play is to use security and scare yeah. tactics to say, no, we can't give you privacy anymore. We're going to take that away because we actually have the access to know where you are and what you're doing and who you're yeah. hanging out with. So, you know, there, I think there will always be this conflict. Yeah. And, you know, so they know he's a bad guy, but can you arrest somebody before they do something bad, right? It's an age old question. Yeah, age -old I think question. my fundamental theory, though, is different. It's going in a different direction, which is, yeah, there's always going to be those issues, and that's a political nightmare. But right now, fundamentally, the tech business in the data business is changed. Data is the new currency, it's the new oil, it's the new scarce resource. Why can't we use the data to impact our analog world like government? So, Obamacare, okay. Yeah, they're going to jam it through really fast and loose. Is it going to be perfect? No. But can they then use the data to figure out how to make it better? That's what I worry about. The government seems to be so out in the left field on actually using any iterative approach, a concept we call agile, 
They don't have that. So what right, concerns right. me is it's just another, you know, putting the toothpaste back into the tube and putting it out there in some Republican version of Obamacare, which will, which will be, you know, just a train wreck. So. Well, I mean, the, the, the good news is, right, and again, we don't want to get too political, but if you look at history, you know, Obamacare was put through a 100% partisan vote. Right, there was no Republican support at all. Now, at least the Republicans are coming back with an alternative. So without arguing about the, the benefits of one versus the other, My point is, the good news is at least they're talking about it. And I don't know what the date is. I mean, it's- That's the whole point. I mean, I just finished open the Elon up. Musk book. It's a open, great book. Open talking about data. SpaceX versus NASA and the way private companies do things, as you said, with data versus kind of the old government way. And they just have a real hard time changing. You know, it's just kind well, of not in the DNA. They got to change. I think one of the things that we should do is amplify as a tech culture and saying, get your shit together and open up the data. Right, right. And you know, open up the data, then no one can hide. So if you bring that open source ethos to Obamacare, I think that would be, to me, I could swallow this change. And with the wiretapping, same thing. Make the data transparent. Let's see who's hiding behind the, 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 the covers there. I mean. Who yeah, unmasked, but, you know, who approved, who made that call? Right, right. But that's then, illegal. But but that's, well, you know, our, our boy uh, Snowden brought things up long ago and had to run to Russia. So now everyone looking back in hindsight, was he yeah. the good guy or the bad Jeff, guy? You, it's not you, so clear. Jeff, you always have the favorite quote I love. You turn the lights on and you see all the cockroaches <laughs> running for the corners. So that's what's going on in government right, right now. Right. Turn, Open up the data and just watch all the cockroaches. I mean, to me, that's really what's going on. Everyone's going to be running for the hills. And I don't think that Trump is any more corrupt than some of the other the president certainly is more bombastic and kind of loose cannon, but it just seems that if Obama truly, people truly surveilled him, then that's, <laughs> politics is but dirty, again, but, politics but, is but, dirty. But should they be surveilling him so that they see the guy that just ran the truck down the people in London because you know he's on the list? Again, that's where you get in these, these huge conflicts and it's it's kind of the spies dilemma. When do you tell, when do you tell the information that you have without disclosing the fact that you have the information? You know, it's, you get it, you're a parent. It's the same thing when you're a parent, you know, you, you know what's going on, but you can't really tell them because you want to still have that access, that information in case something more important comes along. Well, I just think, you know, the wire tower, I think we're, gonna, we're never going to crack the code on the, on the intelligence stuff because the authorities going to keep that black art stuff hidden. But Obamacare and some of the stuff out in the open, I do believe that, you know, that and some of the terrorist things, you got to open up the data because that's the only way to do a checks and balances is that I think just the government's business model, how they operate is in the stone age. And I think getting digital will help them and not just a website, we're truly getting them and transforming. But other than that, it's just another train wreck of Obamacare coming, in my opinion. Yeah, it's kind of what are you performing to, right? What attributes are your priority? And the SpaceX versus NASA thing is pretty interesting. They're talking about can you use commercial electronics for some of this space stuff? And the data says you can, but if you're optimizing 100% for safety versus economics, you may put a different weight on how much you're willing to spend on a particular yeah. chip or not. And so I think it's it's about incentives and what are people working towards, and the government has a different set of incentives than the private sector. And that's well, why now maybe, SpaceX maybe. is shooting satellites up for like a tenth of the cost of a traditional this is my point traditional why thing. not open up the market a little bit open up the data let's see what happens hell this is the whole premise of healthcare. care right, right and i think the whole obamacare was open it up but the government slows it back down again right, right. you know well i mean again the good the, the problem with it is, is as long as it's a political football right it's going to be difficult because it, because why would you sign up for something that the that the other side can take charge of and turn it off that's really what scared me about obamacare because you knew it was a football it had nothing to do with yeah, people it's just good want health care right? bottom line is the government ends up screwing it up anyway so that's what i worry about so if you open up the data to your cockroach example turn the lights on shine the light on the problem and then ultimately that is the way to do it that's what open source is done, I think that paradigm going to government would be something compelling. Okay, enough of that. That's, let's get that off our chest. And of course, the terrorist thing is going to give Trump a ton of power because now it's going to be like, we can't have that happen in our country. Right, so how much how much privacy are we going to give up in letting people survey us in, in the interest of security, right? That's the well, classic. That's the classic. This uh, is the blockchain. This is why I like deal. the blockchain concept. I mean, we. I think personally, go search my email. I have nothing to hide. You know, go poke around if you want to look for patterns and terrorists take it take my email but ultimately so, so why do you th so we covered a couple of little blockchain events uh, before and you know bitcoin's been around for a while what what do you think happened to kind of at least feels like for in IBM's in instance this last yeah. week get blockchain to a tipping point 
Um, I think the momentum in open sourcing, you know, IBM did a good thing there. I think there's a momentum on the developer community. I think most people who understand computer science and are techies get totally intoxicated with blockchain because the, what, what blockchain can do is completely change the game on how things run from a transaction standpoint. It takes down all the costs of doing things. So one of the things I learned at IBM was the you know, double entry accounting is basically built for reporting and audit. Right, right. That goes away with blockchain. Right, <laughs> it's right. one big distributed audit system and it can't be hacked, right? So that it's, it's a really good system of record uh, for doing transactions and that's why people built corporations to create a structure for to do commerce and do business. Right, right. So the nature of the firm concept and we learned in business school is shattered. Yeah, well so, the, the part I love is trust as a service. Trust and privacy protection. So for instance, you can have bit, uh, blockchain be an identity network and distributed network maintaining full privacy and multiple records. So to me, I think that's leveling, it impacts banking, supply chain, media, and you know, Don Tapscott had a great um, quote, we're, we're going to play this clip and we'll discuss it, but he talks about to me fundamentally why the blockchain is a cultural shift because if it does play out the way it does, it will give younger generations or entrepreneurs an opportunity to, to decimate existing billions of dollars of business. And I think that people will work together in an ecosystem way. If the stakes are that high, you'll see blockchain go from the momentum now to ecosystem formation and take down incumbent industries. And I think that's going to be, to me, the deciding factor. So let's play the clip from Don Tapscott, where I asked him specifically how he sees blockchain. He really kind of sums it up nicely. First of all, I see this change in culture profoundly. So artists can get fairly compensated for the work they create. Imogen Heap puts her song on a blockchain platform and the song's inside a smart contract that specifies the IP rights. And you want to listen to it, maybe it's free. You want to put it in your movie, it costs more. She, the way she describes it is the song acts as a business and it has a bank account. So we can profoundly change many aspects of culture, bringing more justice um, to, to our culture. But I'm not sure there'll be a counterculture in the traditional sense, because you've got people embracing blockchain that want to fix a bunch of problems, but also people who want to make large organizations more competitive and more effective. The smart banks are embracing this because they know they can cut their transaction costs in half, <laughs> probably. Okay, that was Don Tapscott, who's the author of The Blockchain Revolution. Uh, he wrote Wiki, Wiki, Wikinomics, Paradigm Shift, you know, decades ago about digital business, total future, a real futurist, not a phony futurist. He actually has a track record of looking at the future and super impressive. Um, Jeff, Don is phenomenal. His son, Alex, is a father-son team working together. What I try to find is super awesome. But that's, he nailed it. Blockchain yeah. is fundamentally can change the nature of business. And I think he, he covered so many different, you know, areas in which it can have an impact beyond the simple transactions. But it's funny, you talk about young people, right? They already swap money with their phones with Venmo and some of these other these other systems. So, you know, they're not tied into the to the old way. You know, they, they don't even have ATMs. They don't even know what cash is. Yeah. I mean, think about blockchain. Um, he brought up in the interview, I didn't play the clip, but he called Facebook data frackers, and meaning that they frack data like oil frackers and actually are screwing things up. And what he means is, we're giving information to Facebook for the use of their free application, which some people now are getting off because they're so pissed off with all the political coverage, but they're using the, f the data that we provide and making money, billions of dollars. Right, right. Mark Zuckerberg is a billionaire because we give As him Google our or asset. Everybody else. And right. his point in blockchain is you can now seriously create and model to take down Facebook. So you, Facebook is at risk as a business of going out of business because of blockchain. To me, that is fundamentally what blockchain is all about. So as an entrepreneur, some kid who's you know 15 years old on YouTube could say, you know what, I'm going to build an anti-Facebook and could potentially compete with blockchain and take out Facebook. That wow. is the level of, of, of disruption potentially that could happen. Yeah, John, I'm a huge fan of Don Tapp. Got introduced to him, uh, guys, I guess it's been 20 years ago now since business school, but uh, you know, the guy's always out on the leading edge, a really great thought leader. And he's working with his son, I love that. And like I said earlier, anyone who goes to business school knows that 
how business works. Blockchain can blow that all up. That's what I love about that. On our next segment, we're going to talk more about what's going on in Silicon Valley and some of the disruption in the culture there and kind of what's blowing in the wind, what's happening, where is the action coming from? Robert Hershevec. People obviously know you from Shark Tank, but the Hershevec group has been really laser focused on cybersecurity. So I actually helped to bring a product called Checkpoint to Canada, firewalls, URL filtering, that kind of stuff. But you're also an entrepreneur, right? And you know the business, you've been in software, you're in the tech business, and I'm, I'm striking, you get a lot of pitches as entertainment meets business. On our show, we're a bubble. We don't do a lot of tech deals like we're talking because it's boring TV. Tech people love tech, yeah. consumers love the benefit of tech. Yeah. You know, no consumer opens up their iPhone and says, oh my gosh, I love the technology behind my iPhone. What's it been like being on the Shark Tank? You know, filming is fun and hanging out it's fun, and it's fun to be a celebrity at first. Your head gets really big, and you get really good tables at restaurants. And Who says tech has uh, got a little pizzazz? I mean, More skin in the game. Today for us. In charge of his destiny. Robert Hershevik. No. Dancing with stars, of course. Here is Cube Alumni. You're listening to Cube Fridays, brought to you by Silicon Angle Media. Now, here's John Furrier. Okay, back at the Silicon Valley Friday show with John Furrier. Jeff Frick here, my guest here. Uh, thanks for uh, look, enjoying that beautiful Don Tapscott thing, Jeff. Amazing, amazing uh, piece about blockchain. Um, tons of stuff happening in the Valley. This is one of them. You're starting to see with blockchain, a cultural shift obviously is disrupt disruption, but the other disruption is a cultural shift, and I've talked about this on theCUBE, where social good is now part of the DNA of the younger generation. You're seeing, I mean, the stuff that we did, we have a purpose. Purpose-led organizations seem to resonate and attract millennials. Obviously, our purpose is free content, extracting the signal from the noise. We were doing women in tech interviews in 2010 before it was so-called fashionable. Now it's the, it's the rage, of course. We were, were for equal pay, equal rights, et cetera. That's our purpose, free content, creating a, a community approach, like open source software, open source content. But there's a shift of social good. Castanova Ventures is doing a fellowship. We did the tech truth. Uh, at South by Southwest, Intel had this AI for social good. The content was awesome and the results of the traffic was amazing. Mark Benioff was on stage with the CEO of IBM at their previous event, Ginny Rometty, talking about the societal changes. So this is a huge shift. Maybe it's post 9-11 generation coming into the workforce, don't know. What's your thoughts? Or maybe it's just because it's easier. You know, there's so many ways that you can do things. Um, Casey Neistat, a guy I follow on YouTube, I'm a big fan, you know, he just put together, a friend of a friend put together, you know, send, send money to Somalia. They raised $2 million in like two days and got Turkish Airlines to donate space on a plane, to, they're the only airplane that flies in there and deliver tons and tons and tons, like 200 metric tons of food. So I don't know, it's it, because it's, it's easier that you can actually do stuff. I think there's a little bit of the software ethos. I, I think, you know, a big part of software ethos is you can actually write a little piece of code and see it and change the world with it. And I think, you know, maybe that's part of the driver, but it is certainly a very well, important piece, The ability piece, to right? connect the people on the internet has been number one. And this is a game changer and this is a social collaboration. So combine connected networks, internet of people, and celebrities like Casey or uh, folks on theCUBE that we talk to can mobilize millions and millions of dollars People recognize that. So that again, that's disrupting the old way, the United Way, you know, the old, you know, right. nonprofits. Yeah, the other thing I think that too, were taking John, a lot of profit and probably putting it in their pockets, but I mean I think that's that everything is a service too is an interesting, you know, kind of twist on this story because you know, people are not as much into stuff, right? The, the, the young kids today are not looking forward to their first car, you know, they're much more experiential. Um, and so, you know, that opens up. If you don't have that desire to save that money to get that first car, you know, that maybe changes the way you think well, about giving Well, I totally the think, the, I think the millennial generation and, and, and the generation that's coming after them will be social conscious and I think that now that you're starting to see the breakdown of traditional how business models are working, so even some of the venture-backed companies are, are hemorrhaging and, and groping for relevance, like Medium's got a new business model for $5 a month. It's like they're groping and guessing. And that shows a sign of the marketplace. Younger generations want to come in and work for a company that's going to have a purpose. Right, right. And they want to feel, it's not so much about the, the company perks of old. Right, well even like Atlassian has one of my favorite ones. They used to, they, and I'm sure they still have it, it was 10 seats for $10 and the $10 went to build schools in Africa. Who can't, 
who can't not Turn take that advantage down. of that deal, <laughs> right? Everybody feels good. They get a new customer. Yeah. The customer feels good. It, 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 it's a real thing. They invite the people over. They go over and film film the spot. So it does seem to be, and maybe it's just a different twist, because like you said, before it was kind of top yeah. down. You were kind of forced as big co to put aside some percentage of your yeah. money into United Way, but now it's a yeah, little it's bit a, the uh, looser. Shift, the cultural shift's happening, and again, in Silicon Valley, I can smell it, I can feel it in the air. Maybe it's like when you have a bad knee, you can feel the weather patterns changing. For me, I can feel it coming, and what's happening is there is a massive revolution that no one's seeing. It's going to create so much wealth, and I think a lot of people, maybe 90% of the people, even some of the big names like Mark Andreessen, aren't getting it. I think that's the key, is that you look at blockchain, the dots are connecting. It's not just points in time that they're investing. If you look at the, the, the arc of what's changing, there is going to be a generational replacement of people here in Silicon Valley, including the people like Andreessen Horowitz, Sequoia Capital, um, the, the gatekeepers, the so-called guys who are, are making the market, they're going to get decimated. I see that coming, and it's going to be out of the blue. It's going to come from left field. It's going to come from right field. It's the blockchain. It's the big data. Something different is happening, and that is totally is in the air. And you can see it. Company goes out of business here. Company groping for a business model over here. Come on, guessing here. Investors throwing good money after bad. Where's the success? That's the question. Look at it. You can't see it. Yeah. Well, as you said, it's in the data. And it's combining data in new and innovative ways. It's, it's using the algorithms. It's using your proprietary data and open data and finding the new patterns, putting things together in a slightly different Preparing way. Preparing for a perfect storm of innovation. Who's going to take advantage? That's what we're looking for. I'll tell you, I can feel it. It's happening. Of course, we'll cover it on Silicon Valley Friday show and theCUBE. We're going to be horizontally scalable at all the shows. Huge lineup coming out. We're going to be in Germany, all over the place, getting the data, bringing it out. Thanks for watching Silicon Valley Friday Show. See you next week.